Okay, so it's uh, noon, so I think it's about that time. I'd like to uh, welcome everyone for attending both in person uh, and through Zoom today for our final seminar series of this semester as we approach uh, the end of the term and the winter solstice. I hope everyone enjoys, uh, I guess, their marking and their exams. But before that, we have a wonderful presentation from Dr. John Gunn. Um, and I'll let him introduce the, the title of the project and everything, but I want to again thank everyone for attending today, both in person and online. Uh, Andre is online uh, to uh, support the online crew, and I'll be here to support the in-person crew. And uh, without further ado, uh, thank you for coming, and Dr. John Gunn. Thank you, Blake, and uh, thank you, everyone that's uh, here and, and watching. Um, it's, a, it's a really special day in the world today. Uh, a really serious day in the world when uh, now nearly 100,000 delegates are, are arriving in this city that's on the screen, Dubai, from uh, 160 different countries. And uh, they're facing and discussing the, the true crisis that uh, the world is in. Uh, there's other crises, like the wars that are also happening, but uh, all the nations of the world recognize this is a, a crisis that affects everyone. And I'm just showing an image of Dubai itself. And I see in that image, the problem we face. This is the world's tallest building. This is the symbol of affluence and excess and uh, the unsustainable uh, use of fossil fuels and materials of all sorts. So uh, this was once a productive fishing village. And now in many sense, it's uh, a symbol of uh, uh, the damaging influence of a unplanned future. It's actually built on sand and it's an eroding sand, which is also uh, an interesting uh, consideration. Here's another tower to power uh, from 51 years ago. The COP meeting today is 20, the 28th meeting to deal with the crisis. And it started yesterday indicating that we're truly going to make act, take actions this time. 51 years ago was the first time the nations of the world got together for the UN Environment Conference in Stockholm. And they were facing then what seemed like a irreversible problem, that transboundary pollution uh, of acid rain was destroying resources in one country, but caused by another. Ironically, that was the year against the resolutions of the conference, we opened the tallest smokestack in the world in this city. This city, Sudbury, is where we're speaking from today. It's not built on sand. It's built on a, a bedrock at the edge of a meteorite-created crater. And we're located uh, in the traditional territory of a tick machine, Anishinaabeg, one of the First Nations, in the area of the Robeson-Huron Treaty in Canada. We're going to try to take some examples from this tower to power is uh, been abandoned. And much of the problems of that era have been solved, including the disregard for transboundary relationships and the need for collaboration to solve these problems. You can't just solve it in your backyard. Superstack is uh, is a symbol of the change that's happened. And now that it has been abandoned and replaced with new technologies. The two towers are dealing two different issues. One is the CO2 tower, the greenhouse gas tower of the world. And the super stack was the SO2, simple change of one letter. Can we apply any of the technologies or any of the approaches to the new problem? The conference organizers faced a reality check just two weeks before they opened. Biblical scale floods hit this desert community, washing the uh, 
luxurious vehicles into huge piles all over Dubai and uh, worries about the stability of some of these buildings in a uh, in an environment that's no longer stable. They were also hit with the reports that rolled in just prior to the meeting, like the broken record report that the UN produced. A nice turn of words there that I like. Uh, the number of broken records in the world today, this is the warmest year in the history of recorded earth. This is the year that Canada exceeded its fire damage by so much. This is a year when all kinds of records are being broken for extreme event uh, environments. And as the broken record report shows, we haven't addressed the problem. The emissions of all the affecting compounds are still rising. So today as the world uh, joins together at Dubai, uh, the crisis is real and uh, and it uh, needs to be addressed. So what can we do at this little location that we're in, in this particular university? That will be, I'll show you some fairly modest efforts, but our main goal is to inspire. We act locally and we impact globally. That's our goal. And some of my impactors are with me today. Is last year we were invited to serve, to participate in the World Biodiversity Convention Conference in Montreal and to bring this stark example to the world. I broke into the conference room at night and we, we, we stole the gavel, but I, I did give it back. Uh, but that image of the before and after Sudbury is a very impactful image, suitable for a meteorite site on Earth, where impact is what we have to do now. And sharing that, acting locally, inspiring and impacting globally is all we can do at this stage. And at three o'clock in the morning, Avery and Anastasia were virtually in Dubai. At uh, the meetings in Montreal last year, we met up with the Oxford University-led uh, leader of the Nature Positive University Initiative. This is an alliance of 130 universities around the world that are attempting to shame their universities into action. Uh, shame them in terms of their their investments, their procurement policies, uh, the way they treat their own campuses, and what sort of educational material we provide to, uh, to our students. And since Earth Day uh, of this year, our university and its leadership, I have to thank them, and even our union, have braced this idea wholeheartedly. And we have become a nature positive university to, uh, to complete the work on our campus and to inspire others in other campuses. And I thank Avery and Anastasia who served last night on the panel with uh, other members of the, of the ambassadors of the world in that role. And she got a good night's sleep. I don't know how you can be looking so fresh today. Dubai Day is what we're calling today at Laurentian. And uh, we have our sculpture that the students themselves have paid for out of their fees. Every student contributed $4 to attend Laurentian University for environmental sustainability. And with that, they've supported a number of important projects. In including reminding of us of our legacy in tree planting and reclamation work. And this sculpture speaks to learning, it's in our nature. And we're also crafting a new environment program called Environmental Solutions to carry that into the future. We're a campus created by a meteorite, we're shaped by glaciers, and we're a high, we will be, when we get our feet under us again, a high impact university in the world because of the young people 
that are insisting on it. The old guard can step aside. It's the young people that need to take this on and they're leading. And one of them, they, they called on some other uh, big shots in the world to help them. And uh, Dr. Jane Goodall has stepped up. And here she is working with these students to uh, create a pledge that graduate student, graduating students at Laurentian now all, if they're willing, take the pledge for sustainability. And in return, they get to wear the Jane Goodall Green Leaf of Hope pin. And I believe at the convocations that we've just gone through, 1,000 students chose to wear the pin. And Jane herself is thrilled by this and has been carrying this message of green leaf of hope around the world. She's not in Dubai today, but I just heard last night that her film, Reasons for Hope, will be screened at Dubai on December the 6th. And that is very much uh, a Sudbury regreening story. <clears throat> Science North, it's only $10. You've got to go down and see it. <clears throat> Today, I'm going to drop down to a very local level, because one of the requirements of being a nature positive university is you have to care and tend to your own university and its campus. And give a report card of how well you're doing as a campus and an, in a nature positive university network. So I don't really care about political boundaries or, or niceties very much. So rather than use the political boundaries of the university, I wanted to use the watershed boundaries of how we interact with nature. So for this first report card, and I'll just give you a few glimpses of what the report card uh, covers uh, before I return to big issues later, we'll just give you some quick results. We're gonna talk about the Lake Laurentian watershed uh, biodiversity assessment. And our president's interested in the question of, was the lake named after our university as an honoring of our community engagement, our responsibilities to our neighbors? I don't know the answer, but I said, yes, that's, <laughs> that's the answer. And it will be the answer that we will work together with our neighbors more than we did before. And that will be very important in the rebuild. So if you take a, a look at the change in our, our watershed, the Lake Laurentian watershed, here are the things, the drivers of change from the year that the university was created in 1960 to now. The major reductions in sulfur emissions from the world's largest point source of sulfur is the overwhelming offense. The massive tree planting efforts that members of the audience are, were involved in. Water management uh, and water level management, and also the reintroduction and restoration ecology of various species. These are what created the change that the students went out to look for this year. The events of the future that they have to consider are these, the extreme floods that are going to come. 22 people have drowned in downtown Sudbury in the last hundred years from poorly managed flood conditions. More might happen in the future. In the Junction Creek area, that was the last death was in 2008. Extreme ice storms, that's my house. 89 homes lost their roof. Mine right to the top of the brick under the weight of ice of the ice storm. That will come again. And I sat on an advisory panel for a community home and I told them, double the strength of the roof, because it's ice storms of the winter that you're going to be facing. I have the cheese. The the uh, debris? debris? The, the, no, uh, no, the 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 cheese. It's machete, really, but you call it something summer. else. That uh, made made it so uncomfortable to breathe, and bring it and bring together the reality of the impacts of health and the environment is something we have to plan for. And the other thing is drought, is that's the conservation area under drought, but this was a self-imposed drought of the past. So for this talk, those are the four big drivers that uh, the university and its landscape uh, should be managing for. 
this is the average temperatures that's happening and it's probably Al is here is probably out of date now, but that's the rising temperatures in Sudbury as a mean annual temperature. And we're heading toward Vancouver temperatures uh, well before the end of the century as our average temperature. That's not going to uh, be the extreme temperatures. And I'm standing beside a fish kill there in the Kelly Lake area when extreme temperatures happen. Uh, so we'll expect very extreme temperatures as well going into the future. But we have to celebrate something. And that is that we've, we've been there before and dealt with technology problems. And, and here, for example, is one of the companies in town, and both companies have been very successful in this, have reduced their air pollution down to 2% through uh, wise management and thinking of their products, not as just money, but to, as a system in which one tries to avoid waste and be efficient. Because most of the damage is in companies is by inefficiency and waste. They've reduced their sulfur dioxide by 38, 98%. This is famous around the world, this a phenomena that they've achieved. But as the white stack, now they sell sulfur dioxide as a product in the form of sulfuric acid going out in train cars. That's turning a problem into a product. The same with the nickel and metal particulates, 95% reduction in metals. Why would you throw that away? That's what you sell. Turning a pollutant back into the product it was. And why would you buy expensive fossil fuel when you can function with less? So they've reduced their fossil fuel and diesel use by 40%, all under the efficiency, but at the same time to meet the regulations of the company, of the, of the government and the demands of the people that are asking for it. There's other waste that's out there that needs to be tapped too. And, and uh, the waste piles of the past, for instance, the Coppercliff tailings pile contains eight to nine billion dollars of waste nickel. And uh, our scientists, including Nadia Mikachuk, are finding ways of harvesting that waste in a low carbon environment. This process, bio-leaching, actually absorbs CO2. And uh, these are the kinds of technologies that will turn waste uh, back into a solution. This figure I've used many times is that people are now mobile. That's why the room's not full today. People are working at home. They can work anywhere in the world. But a community that wants to attract professionals and wants to have, a, wants to have the quality of life that Sudbury achieved by dealing with its air pollution. And you can see the phenomenal things that have happened in Sudbury while the air pollution is being reduced the fourth largest film festival was created. Science North was created. All manners of public assets were created, which cause or co correlation, I'm not sure, would unlikely to happen again in a polluted environment where people have a choice. Nature, we forgot she's powerful too. And natural regeneration is really helping in the system. This is two, a before and after picture where tree planting wasn't predominantly used. So a massive amount of return of nature, if given a chance, is what uh, Jane Goodall speaks about. But of course, it was the public that uh, were recognized at the first Earth Summit in 1992 for the regreening work. And our, many of our colleagues led that work. In the conservation area alone, there's half a quarter of a million trees have been planted. And it was because of the 10th million tree that the minister and the prime minister and Jane Goodall were here last year to celebrate the, the uh, 10 million tree. And uh, uh, natural solutions like uh, tree planting uh, have a very large role to play as a 
a literature review revealed today to us all. But I'm just going to narrow in on this little conservation area and see some of the surprises we came up with. Is uh, Today, compared to 1945, there's four times as much standing water on the landscape as there was in the past. A barren, hot, evaporative landscape doesn't hold much water. Uh, this expansion in water is both man-made with a, a dam system, but also beavers have returned to the landscape and engineered uh, the solution. I didn't even know this happened in our backyard, that all of a sudden water has returned to the landscape uh, as part of the restoration and clean air environment. And water on the landscape will be very necessary in preventing fire and stabilizing climate issues in the future. There was also in the past more historic use. There was farming on that landscape. Three farms where the ski area is today and gravel pits. Those have been converted instead today into recreational area use. And this area that we share with, the, with the, our neighbors is such an important landscape for Laurentian University. People that run and ski and those that went on to the Olympics from our ski trails got their start here in the, uh, in the conservation area. And many uh, kids uh, got their first introductions to nature in the, in the nature chalet that began in 1967. Maintaining water quality, uh, Maintaining these water levels will be critical under the pressures we're ahead, we have in the, in, the, uh, in the future. It's going to be hot and dry and windy. And those wetlands are at risk. And, and we know that because we've experimentally manipulated that before, or some of our colleagues have seen natural drought cycles. This was the year that the dam was removed on Lake Laurentian. And what it told us is that uh, when you throw 100 million tons of sulfur into the atmosphere and 100,000 tons of nickel particulates, gravity still exists. They fall down. They're laying on the land. That's a legacy you have to protect yourself from. And when you lower water levels and allow all that material to oxidize, that time bomb goes off and they come back. it comes back out again. So the pH, in the when they re-wetted the landscape, pH plunged from 6.5 to 4 or 6, and metal levels reached toxic levels, eliminating all of the major biota in the system at the time. So that uh, management action today, when they fix the dam, they put a barrier dam around it. Rather than just drain it, they protected it uh, so that water level, and this water level management will be very important going forward. Water quality is improving. Uh, that we have very limited information on our closest lakes. It's something it's fun to go sampling in Clarney Park or Iceland, but we forget to sample in our backyards. So these landscapes are now living laboratories for the Nature Positive University. But what we can see is that the chemistry of the lakes has changed in some ways. But the most remarkable change has been in the rise in salt in the lake. And this comes to in, in play simply because the bypass uh, entered the watershed in uh, 1992. And, and one of our salt specialists is here today. And she realizes that uh, letting salt levels rise in our waters is, uh, is leading uh, ultimately to algal uh, production or blooms as you kill off the little uh, lawnmowers, the zooplankton that eat, uh, they don't like the salt. A dead lawnmower is not very good for cutting grass. So uh, you got to keep the lawnmower alive. We also see that our sensitive species are returning. We didn't have but uh, a sensitive species like amphipod, which was missing in both of the two major lakes, uh, is back in good numbers in the lakes today. And the most important is fish, of course. Uh, there were no fish in 1980, and there were four species in 1991, and now seven species. And this is partly because this is primarily because we've uh, 
reintroduced a, uh, a recreational fishery to the area to let people enjoy that uh, area. I don't believe in catch and release fishing, but I do believe in catch and kill and eat fishing. Uh, it's much more pleasant and, and sustainable, I think. But the four species that are surprises in there are likely uh, locally bought bait fish that came in by way of people releasing their bait at the end of their fishing trips. But an interesting system in our backyard for students to study these types of uh, introductions and invasives and such. The fish stocking happened from one of our local lakes to another. It was in 1996, 100 uh, small pike were moved from behind the hospice over to the conservation area. And they quickly produced a, a massive uh, sport fishery that many as a local visitor I've sent there for their families who have, their kids have never caught a fish. Well, just go down the road to the conservation area and you can catch a pike. Uh, and, uh, and that's what people do. And the pike there, if you want to know, averaged around two pounds and the biggest they caught was seven pounds. And the interesting thing about them is and though it's in the industrial city, we don't have any contaminant concerns in eating those fish. This is the way the ministry presents contaminant data. It shows that if you like, you can eat 32 meals of this fish every month uh, and not exceed the limit. And uh, why that's happening is an interesting finding from Laurentian University that our recently uh, retired colleagues uh, are responsible for. And that's Dr. Nels, uh, Nelson Belzil and Uwe Chen. And they showed that uh, one of the byproducts of the smelter is selenium, an essential element that's in your multi-pack in the morning something that Scandinavians eat all the time because it uh, uh, ameliorates mercury and blocks the uptake of mercury into muscle tissue. Uh, and Nelson and Uwe showed that lakes that were close in with high selenium had low mercury. And that study has continued on around the world that even to the point of trying to use it as a solution for treating areas and uh, uh, we thank them for their work on this project. The road salt assessment is something that's current and every day right now. And in my neighborhood, just this week, we stopped road salting nine kilometers of roads. And my road street is not salted this year, and it was last year. That's because I live beside one of the saltiest freshwater lakes in Ontario. And uh, and our drinking water now is reaching a level of uh, exceedances for risk uh, as well. So we did sample the, the outlets from the university and the various outlets along the shore, and we found that uh, the culvert in front of the university, the university has to take responsibility for the drinking water of the city from now on. It can't be bringing students in to pollute the water that they drink in the water fountain. It's the same water comes back up the hill with the same salt in it. I don't remove salt at the uh, sewage treatment, at the treatment plant on David Street. And we can see that uh, Lake Laurentian has a bit of an elevated uh, salt. And we, we can't afford to do all the analysis with sodium and chloride. So we use the surrogate of uh, conductivity. And they went out and quickly mapped. Where does it all come from? It comes from the bypass where all the hot spots are, or it comes from the parking lots around the university. So that was an example of a student-led project at a university in Canada, where they're bringing to their administration the data, the, data, the status of their campus. And this will be updated in the years ahead. And it, right, Eric, we're even going to have one of our courses keeping the records as part of the field camp course at Laurentian that will keep regular records of how these things are changing going into the future and allow the Nature Positive University to report change in the decades ahead. 
Our mayor, we came back from COP15 in Montreal and our mayor who was a member of parliament and knew the minister of the, of the current minister was very excited to take on the challenge of in this famous polluted city that's done so much damage and now recovery, can we be the first municipality in all of Canada to protect 30% of our land by 30, 30, 2030, our land and water, where we have to deal with all the things we deal with. And he has formed a task force, and some of them are listening today, and we meet fairly regularly, a very good task force of how can we get to this challenge, uh, working together. And I'll just bring a few of these items uh, for you now is how do we extend the good work that the students are doing in the university to what can the university or the whole municipality do in shaming the world and being an impactful uh, municipality around the world? Especially when you have such a black and white story to tell. You were the famous of being polluted and damaged. You know, you get to brag if you can uh, reverse that. So one of the first ideas we have is to work together again, not to pollute our neighbors, <laughs> to work with our neighbors. And the first, uh, one of the first discussions is, can we not bring this connection of land, the Laurentian University land abuts the conservation area, it abuts the municipal land, it abuts a provincial park, and it abuts valleys lands. Can we, turn this into a protected corridor for wildlife and uh, contribute 35 square kilometers to the 3030 challenge, which I know is only a tiny fraction of what we have to protect overall. It's a lot to protect 30% of a big municipality. But it's exciting possibilities because we actually found an elk living within the corridor already. And many faculty were here at Laurentian involved in the elk restoration work at Burwash. And those elk have made their way up to Sudbury and, uh, and a trail camera picked up one uh, in, the, in the corridor of the uh, proposed. Uh, so how exciting can that be? Because uh, if people don't love fish, they all seem to like big animals or turtles, one or the other. But uh, you have to give them something. Uh, so yeah, an elk, I guess, is what we'll give them for the corridor uh, going into the future. I've actually seen on that same lake the final remains of a moose on the ice eaten to hair and bones only by a, a pack of wolves. That's in the city of Sudbury in a provincial park that was enacted as a restoration park to the, for the study of restoration. Sudbury, it's, call, it's called Daisy uh, Upland uh, Park, but uh, I call it the Sudbury Restoration Park until uh, if I say it often enough, people will remember that's the right name. Now, another big idea is can we uh, become a UNESCO World Heritage Site? Could we not uh, lift up this story to make it relevant to the world that all these other stories can be embedded in it? And this is the story of the impact that has created the university and the wealth that runs this city. And that's for those that aren't familiar with this picture, is the picture of uh, an X-ray image of the Sudbury Basin as it exists today, 1.8 billion years ago, after that meteorite, and we got a very clear picture of the meteorite there. It, I, I don't know who got that picture, but when it came in and formed this second largest crater on earth, bigger than the one that killed the dinosaurs, uh, 1.8 billion years ago. And then a second one came plunging in and created our water supply. Wanapate uh, First Nations resides beside that one. 
1.8 billion, 3.5 million. I always say one is likely to hit today. Uh, the third one is coming. <clears throat> but just to put that in, in, in a, a sense of how big this impact is, I just learned, figured it out, Dave, the other day. It's, 30, it's 60 kilometers across the basin today. That's the bottom of a wash pail where the outer rim was 200 uh, kilometers when it first formed. And all of the rest has been contorted and eroded down. We're looking at the bottom of the wash bucket now. And in Michigan, 500 kilometers away, there's a 45 meter deposit of the, uh, the fallout rocks from Sudbury laying 45 meter debris field, 500 kilometers away. This was a big bang. And uh, we should be a big bang in the world as well. And if we can use uh, these puns and jokes and images to promote the idea that the next university should be a world heritage university with world heritage chairs and, and international uh, scholars in residence for the World Heritage Site, which is the Sudbury Basin. It is the two base, two, uh, two communities are actually each get a, their own basin. <laughs> is the Atikmashin Anishinaabek uh, location is closer to the old basin and Wanapate First Nations is on the edge of the, the new basin. One is the source of mineral wealth. One is likely to be our main drinking water supply for the future if we keep degrading uh, Ramsey Lake with more salt and have to abandon it. And Laurentian will be in there and the conservation will be in there in this World Heritage Site. And I wish that would happen soon so I could be part of it. And, it, and you only have to overlay the other images that we know well is the impact zones. The outer limit is the, uh, uh, the, the three centers are the centers on the, on the uh, smelter sites where the extreme damage was done. And the yellow line uh, encircles the areas where the 10 million trees have been planted by the city in the, and nearly 50% of that area has now been uh, uh, assisted in reclamation. So when I finished giving parts of this presentation to city council the other night, I had to give them instructions of what to do uh, with their conservation area and their French, their evolving friendship with the university. Now we're real buddies and we're gonna work together uh, into the future. And we have to maintain this partnership with our neighbors and work together and share the uh, research opportunities and manage our water levels. Uh, as carefully as we can for the unknown future, including fire on campus and in our neighborhoods. And uh, uh, we've got a, a collaborative project involved with Lakehead University and Nipissing University and McMaster and Brandon Manitoba University to try to bring back uh, the carbon storage capabilities of our wetlands. When the acidification and metal damage was done, we lost the sensitive species of sphagnum, which creates the peat that creates the low oxygen conditions and stores the carbon for the future. That those surface species were very sensitive to the damage and generally are, are close in peatlands are without uh, sphagnum and now they're sources of greenhouse gas rather than sinks for greenhouse gas as they are around the world. So this new group with the uh, NSERC Alliance are working to re reverse that and replace that with perhaps some manipulation. And the first manipulation will likely happen on the Laurentian campus where an experimental wetland will uh, change the vegetation cover and reestablish uh, a sphagnum cover or try to reestablish re a sphagnum cover to see if we can uh, reactivate the carbon storage capabilities of our wetlands in Sudbury. 12% of the city is wetlands. Look at the potential if we could convert them back into carbon storage instead of carbon sources. 
maintaining water sampling. And we've got uh, one of the best groups in the world here in Sudbury with the long-term work of the Freshwater Ecology Unit at our Cooperative Freshwater Ecology Unit, uh, Ministry of Climate Change, part, no, not climate change, <laughs> environment, environment, conservation and parks will continue the monitoring that has made us so famous. Uh, and we're gonna work closely to bring other people into that. Uh, so we are going to maintain our long-term monitoring records that attract scientists from around the world to get access to this data. You know? And the first title in our research center is cooperative. We're never gonna be big enough to do it alone. So we need to bring those people in. And a couple of them are here today, uh, ready to never go home again. And then uh, do what Sudbury does very well is celebrate success and uh, and and uh, partnership with uh, in the arts and in the uh, other ways of celebrating uh, with uh, frequent participation of the public. I'll just uh, end by returning back to our Nature Positive team and uh, really looking for some student recruitment today. We've got such great leadership, but they graduate and then they go on. So if there's any students listening today, yes, I can get you to the next world conference if you come and put your time in. And I can introduce you to Jane Goodall if you come and visit me. So I need you as world leaders, future world leaders, to join the Environmental Sustainability Committee, which has its house at the Freshwater Ecology Unit site, and to take on the, the challenge of the uh, Nature Positive University. And they're meeting with the Board of Governors on December 15th, the current leadership, to tell the university what policy changes does this university need to make to uh, be uh, a suitable university in which they pay their tuition. A couple of the projects that they're considering now is one on food security. Our students are using food banks. Food security is a, an issue all over the world now as climate uh, wrecks havoc. And uh, we're, we just got, they just got funding. They can write proposals in a way I can't uh, begin to from the Toronto Dominion Friends of the Environment to add to the community gardens at the Lake Center and to build an orchard and, uh, and allow international students that are here in the summer to have the chance to grow their own food in, uh, on, on campus. So we hope we can all encourage that to happen and expand that in the years ahead. We also see that we need a place and upgrading the Arboretum uh, with some green technologies and, and uh, expanded facilities so that the annual field course can operate out of there. And this can be the Nature Positive University uh, Pavilion for the future. It's, uh, it was opened, uh, I think, uh, very soon after Prince uh, Philip came to the site, uh, the Duke of Edinburgh, and we I hosted the Duke of Edinburgh leadership team from around the world uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, and those and I told them all these same stories from, uh, and they were very impressed that uh, that Sudbury exists in this way for them to uh, bring it home to their home countries. Part of the food security issue is having access to the food on campus, and we'll encourage students to harvest blueberries and uh, pick their own. Uh, I, I'm not gonna encourage them to do mushrooms, but somebody who knows what mushrooms are, but uh, uh, like eating our own fish, uh, eat our own plants and, and berries. And to, uh, for those few but important people that came today, you each get a product from the work of the student association they picked red currants on site and made red currant jelly for you today and uh, as part of this food security project. The last image is that of uh, asking the question, which I was asked at the other day at uh, one of our local First Nations gatherings is, what was it like when the treaty was signed in, in 1850? 
what are we working towards? What can the target for the future be? And uh, that reminded me of the great film, Back to the Future, with all the wackos on that. It was a fun, fun movie. So what the Back to the Future project is taking the little forest in front of the residence there called Bepi Forest, planted by the landskeeper at Laurentian, 1984. Jared, you remember Bepi well, a person who cared about the, the campus and went ahead and planted his own trees and has made a lovely start on a, what a red pine, red white pine forest should look like. But as a contrast to it, uh, the students have gone off to see what is the final state going to be if we work at this into the future. And they happen to have access within the community of a site in the largest continuous old uh, growth red pine forest in the world. Uh, and that is where we're working again with our student committee and one of our former graduate students. And we're almost there ready to announce the opening of the first indigenous conservation area in, in Ontario. Uh, we've got one problem ahead of us. We've got a mining claim we've got to get rid of, but uh, that should be easy lifting at this point and uh, to get uh, the Wolf Lake Forest protected and as a place that students can go and visit uh, what the target should be and, and compare to their, their model forest. And so far we've done uh, instrumentation on our forest of uh, measuring water, uh, transpir uh, evapotranspiration and carbon storage and temperature. And Adam, what do we have? A mean temperature difference about two degrees that or so if you're a stressed out student, exams are coming up or you're you just broke up with your best, you can sit in a cool forest and do what many uh, Asian doctor physicians recommend is do some forest bathing and uh, de decompress in Bepi's forest with a lovely little trail in it. And with, and with the student funding again, they put a plaque there to explain the fact that Bepi's forest has stored 50 tons of carbon and produced enough oxygen to keep 10 students alive. And uh, for that, we uh, thank the late Bepi uh, for planting it for them. And uh, it should help decompress a few students as well if they can uh, sit down and do some square breathing, four in, hold, four down, hold, four out, hold. That's how the Navy SEALs do it. Uh, so that's the, uh, the big project uh, is to try to bring ourselves from Laurentian to Wolf Lake and, uh, and eventually bring Laurentian into the future with a uh, healthy uh, uh, forest. In the, and, and this is the center where it's all gonna happen. Uh, this is our elite uh, research center that we're attracting new faculty to, to join and be part of, where the Cooperative Freshwater Ecology Unit operates with two provincial governments and a federal government. We have some excellent infrastructure and facilities for those new people to uh, take advantage of. And we have something really interesting on site that was just open the other day is we have the uh, indigenous language trail, which uh, throughout this eight acre site, there's walking trails and signage that interprets the plants and medicinal plants in the proper language. And one of the activists is sitting looking at me right now. <laughs> the thought was, doesn't the first person who discovers something get to name it after themselves? Isn't that the way it's usually done in patents and science? Don't you think the indigenous people standing at that site many years ago, maybe in the 1600s, already knew what a white pine tree was or a white cedar and what it's used for? And so shouldn't the name be first on the list? And didn't they first tell that name to some 
francophone voyageur guy that just came through. So shouldn't the French name be second? And, and the English guy only came later after all the settlement issues. And then some late to this game story of botanists from a museum somewhere put a scientific name on it. So it's very impactful. There's that word again at the Meteorite University that uh, the language is in the order of the discoverers. And the indigenous folks that toured the site the other day were affected by that. They were very pleased with that idea. And I, I thank uh, Taylor for making me learn at my age that this is the right way of doing things. So as you wander around the site, you'll find 25 such signs that name the species of interest for, uh, for you. And we hope to add more as, as time goes on. And we realize the snow cover has covered up some other interesting plants that can be named uh, for any major donor that's out there. Somebody who wants to donate uh, for a research chair. How much? Let's say you own a house in Toronto. Give me that. And uh, that's all we need to uh, have, a, have a chair in, the, in your family's name. Uh, doing this good work. So with that, I thank you.